launching a new series called Divine Dwelling, but it's actually not a new series. We are bringing it back because this is our word for the year. Everybody say Divine Dwelling. Divine Dwelling. Divine Dwelling was the word that God gave our pastors for the year. As a church, we always pick a theme. We always pick a word, a scripture for the whole year. And Pastor Landon encouraged us to do that for our own lives, to pick a word, pick a scripture that you memorize, that you say, this is what God wants to do this year. Because God always wants to do something fresh. He doesn't want us to always just do the same things, but he wants to build upon it. He wants to do something new in your life. And that's why he always has a new vision, has a new word for the year. So God gave that to our pastors. So we're going to kind of recap that because you know, we forget that was a long time ago, beginning of the year. I know I forgot. So we're going to recap it. We're going to go back a little bit today and talk about that. So in 2019, when we launched as Bridge Church, our first uh, ever theme was De Ta Deus, which is actually the Arizona state motto, which means God enriches. That's our state motto, that God enriches. That was our theme for the year. And then 2020, it was the voyage. 2020. And we said, expect the unexpected. And that was in January. And we really did, right? We like that hit too close to home. We really went into uncharted territory. We expected the unexpected. And then in 2021, we took from Ephesians 20 and we said our theme was beyond, that God would go beyond. And we saw him go beyond. We saw four people healed from cancer. We saw Juan stand up out of his wheelchair and walk. We saw miracle after miracle. God went beyond. And then God spoke to our pastors and said, what he had happened in 2021, he will sustain in 2022. So whatever he gave you last year, he will sustain it. The job that he gave you, he will sustain it. The marriage, he will sustain it. The family, he will sustain it. Whatever he has given you, if it is from God, he will sustain it, church. He will make sure that it comes to completion, that the work God began, he will see it through. He will complete it. And maybe you haven't seen that yet this year. Maybe you're like, I'm still waiting and it's August and I haven't seen what God told me he was going to do. He's not done yet. The year's not over. Don't write him out or rule it out. Don't put God in a box because he's not done yet. He still wants to do more in this year and he has more for you. So in 2020, we took on divine dwelling and the Hebrew year for 2022, Pastor Landon taught us, is 5782. That's the Hebrew year for 2022, 5782. And they'll be up here on the screen because in Hebrew, every number has a meaning, has a picture, has a word attached to it. So it actually began and ended from September 8th to September 13th is when the year ended. That's when the Hebrew year ended. And We know, right, that God builds upon each other. So every number means something. So when you put all of it together, when you put five, seven, eight, and two, all of those numbers, it comes together and it means an opportunity for divine protection over the dwelling place. That is what this year means, the biblical meaning of it. So it went from... 5781 to 5782. And we took that and we believe that that was divine dwelling, God's spoken covering for a house of generations. A house of generations, our church, that God would dwell and it would be a divine dwelling. So we are going to unpack that today. We're going to launch it. So this is just part one of that. And Pastor Len will continue it and we'll go through it for the month of August because. We saw it in the beginning of the year. We really felt we need to get our house in order. Our homes, the church, every area, we were like, okay, we're going to get this in order. But y'all know that you don't just clean the house once and it stays clean forever, right? It has to be cleaned again and again and again. And we felt that. It kept coming up like, wow, this is a divine dwelling. This is a divine moment. We need to get our house in order again and again. So we felt that we really needed to bring this up and talk about this again because it is powerful. And I believe that God is going to speak to you today and he's going to talk to us about 
divine dwelling and how to dwell with the Lord. So my, uh, what I'm talking about today it is that you can live under God's authority, then you can live in his divine dwelling. When you live under God's authority, you can live in his divine dwelling. It's a long title, I know. So just put divine dwelling part one, okay? Divine dwelling part one, because blessing is found when we live under God's authority. And how do we do that? How do we live under the authority of God? How do we live and dwell with him? Because we all want that, amen? You guys want that, right? I want that. I want to dwell with the Lord. I want to be in his presence and I want to live under his authority. The points that I have for you today, how to do that, are one, to fear God, two, to have a kingdom mindset, and three, to be a kingdom ambassador. So we will go over all of those three points today. The first point is fear God. Fear God. Every single one of us will be tested if we fear the Lord or not. Jesus wrote that he delighted in the fear of the Lord in Isaiah eleven three. And when someone fears God, we aren't scared of him, but we are actually terrified of being away from him. When we fear God, we walk in true humility. When we fear God, it's not how close can I get to the line of sin, but it's that I want to be so far away from it because I want to be close to God because I fear him and he is Lord over my life. And this is where, you know, religion and legalism has put a bad spin on the fear of the Lord because people will say, well, I fear God and I hate the sinner. But when you fear God, you have God's heart and you hate what he hates and you love what he hates. But when you say, I hate the sinner, you're actually hating what God loves because God loves the person. He hates the sin, but he loves the person. And when you fear God, you have his heart. You love what he loves and you hate what he hates. When we fear God, we know God because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowing God intimately. It's when we get to know him intimately and closely because friendship is reserved for those who fear God. God is not everybody's friend. He is a friend of those who fear him because we have to be afraid. We have to fear God and it's not afraid. It's right. It's not being afraid of God, but it's fearing God. It's a holy fear. And that's where we get that friendship with God. Moses feared God. And he was close to him. Abraham feared God and he knew and he trusted and he followed where he led him. Lot had no clue. He didn't fear God and he was not close to him. Because a person that fears God, we know God intimately. We recognize authority. That is the fear of the Lord. And uh, recently I made a decision that I would believe whatever the Bible said, whether I understood it or not. Because that is the truth, and that is the word of God, and that's what God is speaking. So whether it made sense, whether I believed it, I'm going to believe it. Whether it makes sense or not, I'm going to believe it and trust that this is the word of God, that this is what God is speaking. Because the fear of the Lord doesn't say, I'll believe it if I understand it. But I will believe it regardless if I understand it or not, because it's the word of God. And we have to make that decision. We have to say, I will do that. Because we've seen too much of his kindness to not believe that he is good. We've seen too much of his faithfulness and his grace over our life to not believe that he is good. And friendship is reserved for those who fear God. Because our friendship can only go where his lordship has gone. So I have to realize that he is Lord over my life first, and then I can have the friendship with God. But the lordship and the authority has to come first. My friendship cannot go where my lordship has not been. I have to have him as my Lord over my life first. So fearing God means that we understand there is going to be heartache, right? There's going to be pain. There's going to be things that we go through in life. Life is not perfect and we can we can say that we believe that and the bible says that we have to pray without ceasing and rejoice always and the bible wouldn't say that if we knew right if there wasn't going to be pain if there wasn't going to be heartache if there wasn't going to be suffering it would be useless without that right 
So we say we know that we are called to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, because that means we don't have all the answers. Can somebody testify today that we don't have all the answers of why things happen, of the things that we go through, of what we're experiencing in life? We don't know why things happen. We don't know why that relationship didn't work out. We don't know why that career fell through. We don't know why that happened to that family member. But we have to believe that we don't know all the answers, but God does. And we are trusting the one that does, that holds our future, and that he knows what he's doing. Because the level of revelation that God will give you will be equal to the level of mystery that you can live with. The level of revelation that God will give you is equal to the level of mystery that you can live with. How much mystery can you have in your life? Things that you don't understand why it happened. Things that can't be explained. That's how much revelation God will give you. If you can say, I don't know why this happened, but I'm trusting you, God. I'm going to lay it at your feet. I don't know why this is happening in my life, but I want you to use me. And I want to lay it and give it to you and surrender it to you. To say, here you go, God. You're the one that knows what you're doing. And I want to give it to you and surrender it. Because Jesus isn't a vending machine. We can't beep, 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 and get out exactly what we want, the life that we want, everything perfect. Because sometimes Snickers comes out, and you're like, I didn't pick that. I didn't buy that, right? He's not a vending machine. One time when I was 10 years old, I was at a vending machine with my mom, and we, like, bought it and everything. It was so great. I was so excited. You know, as a kid, you're, like, so excited. Probably as an adult, actually, (laughs) you're, like, more excited. So we bought it from the vending machine, and then it's, like, the right where it like turns around the candy's like gonna fall and it's like and it gets stuck and it doesn't fall it did that and it didn't fall and I was so upset and my mom and I were like shaking it we're like come on fall please like we want the candy and we're trying to get it out we're hitting it and everything and it never fell and then finally like felt like forever I'm finally like oh in Jesus name and I hit it and it fell not even kidding you. Just hope that builds your faith today. So God doesn't give us the answers. He's not a vending machine. There's things that will happen that we don't know why it happened, but I don't want my why to ever take me away from him. I don't ever want to be one that critiques God that says, why is this happening? God, but he's the one that critiques me, not the other way around. So God is our friend but he is our Lord first. Everybody say, he is my Lord first. He is my Lord first. first. So it is so important, such a huge part of life. The Bible tells us to fear the Lord. And how do we know that we fear the Lord? How do we know that we actually mean it, that it's not just what we're saying, that it's not just Christianese, that we're saying the right thing, but that we actually are walking it out, that we actually fear the Lord. The Bible says, that you walk in his ways. You know that you fear the Lord when you walk in his ways. So you actually fear the Lord with your feet, not your feelings. You fear the Lord with movement, not just your mouth. You fear the Lord with your walk, not your talk. Do you hear me today? You fear the Lord with what you're doing, where you're walking, and with your obedience. So if you want to know where, if you fear the Lord, then see where your feet are headed. Are you listening? Are you being obedient? Or are you going in the opposite direction? Because that will tell you if you fear the Lord. It's about where our feet are moving. Because he is our Lord. He's our Father. He is our King. And that's why we fear God. Because he created us for friendship, for relationship. But he wants to oversee us in a rule of ownership. And that's how we can place ourselves under his authority And to fear God. So to live under his authority and in his dwelling, we not only have to fear the Lord, but the second point is that we keep a kingdom mindset. Keep a kingdom mindset. To have a kingdom mindset, you have to understand that we live under a king and that we live in a kingdom. We don't live in a democracy. But when we were saved, we came into a kingdom and God is our king. And we are a people that we try to understand kingdom principles with a democratic mindset. 
but God is our king. He is the real king, not just a figurehead king or a fake one, but he is our real king, which means there is rank and order and authority. He is our king. So we have to relate to him with that mindset that this is a kingdom, that it's not a democracy, but we live in a kingdom. Amen. We live in a kingdom and we came into that. And to have a kingdom mindset, we have to be aware of eternity. We have to know and be aware of eternity. Hebrews 12, 1 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Right before this verse, chapter 11 is all about the heroes of faith, right? The hall of faith. And this is, it says the cloud of witnesses. So the people that have gone before us, Abraham and Sarah, Moses, Noah, all the people that it lists in chapter 11, they are like a cloud, it says. They are watching us. They're a cloud of witnesses. And since this is true, then we have to live a certain way. And that's what this is saying. It's talking about holiness and endurance. Holiness and endurance. Because my passion for holiness and my longevity to endure difficult situations is equal to my awareness of eternity. How I live a life of holiness, how I endure difficult situations is what I'm saying is how I'm aware of eternity. By living holiness and by living of endurance of getting through tough situations, getting through difficult things, because in life we will have ups and downs, we will have trials, we have successes, we have highs and lows, everything that we go through. How we walk through them is a measure of our level of awareness of eternity. Are we aware of eternity? Are we living a holy life or are we walking through it? Are we going with endurance? Are we running the race that God has set before us? That will tell us if we're aware of eternity, that there are people, there is the cloud of witnesses that are watching us. Just like in a relay race, when one person is running and it's time for them to pass the baton and the next person grabs the baton and goes off, we're those people, we're running our race But there is a crowd there. The stands are full of the people that have gone before us that are cheering us on. And they're watching us to see how we finish our race. They are seeing how we finish, how we walk, how we run out this life. And they are cheering you on today. They are cheering you on. And they're the crowd around us as we run this race. We're in the middle of it. People have gone before us and people will go after us. So continue to run your race with holiness and with endurance. Because when we remember and we're aware that they're watching, we won't make stupid decisions, right? We'll try, we'll try not to, we probably will, but we will be more aware of the level of awareness of eternity because they are watching and they are watching to see how we finish our race. To have the kingdom mindset, we have to live aware of eternity. In John 12, 24, it says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. When you have a kingdom mindset, We believe that every loss and every disappointment will become a seed that brings increase. Everything that we go through will bring a blessing, will bring an increase. God wants to use it because, to be really honest, some people walk through life and tragedy and hurt, and they never give it to God. They never invite God to come into it with them. And that seed remains alone, it says in John. It remains alone. It never releases into our life what God can do with it. Because only God can turn a crisis into a blessing. Only God can turn hurt and pain into something that will bring increase, that will bring elevation in our life. And when we give it to him, then he can do that. 
And we need those moments with him, those tender interactions of saying, God, I don't know why this happened. I don't understand this, but I trust you. I want to give this to you because in those moments, a seed is put into the ground. A seed is given to God and it will bring increase. Whatever you're going through, whatever trial you're experiencing, the pain that you're feeling today, it will bring increase. Let me tell you today, and you believe that, that it will bring increase. When you believe it, when you give it to God, and when you put the seed in the ground, God is saying, daughter, let me have that. Let me put it in the ground. Watch what's going to happen. Son, give me that seed. Give me that. And see what I can do when we give it to God. He wants to bring forth increase. Because Galatians 6 says that God is not mocked. So whatever a man sows, he will reap. That is how God created life, that what we sow, we will reap. So for me to think I can plant a seed and it not bring increase is to insult God. He's saying you will reap. You will see the blessing. You will see the increase. You will see the good that can come out of this, of what you're going through. It's in the nature of how God created it. So the most important thing of that, though, is that God will be glorified. Because it's not about us, right? We reap the benefits. We see the blessing. But it's all for him to be glorified. It's all about him. So when we give it to God, when we give our disappointments, then we're having the kingdom mindset. We're aware of eternity. And we're saying, you will bring increase. You will bring forth this. And culture around us, it tells us how to live, right? It tells us what we should believe, the values that we should adapt into our life, how we should live, how we should walk, how we should be under authority. But that's not the truth. And we need to go back to what the truth is. The truth is the word of God. The truth is in the Bible. It's in his word. And this house preaches the word of God. So the church is the truth because we're preaching the word of God, the true word. And you have to think of where, what truth have you been believing Because truth is facts. Truth is not feelings. It doesn't change, but it's constant. Truth is facts. What if you were flying in the airplane and the pilot said, we're going to fly by feelings today. We would be like, get me off this plane. We want the pilot to fly by directions, by training, by maps. We want them to fly by facts. And God is calling us to live by the truth, to fly by facts, and to live a life of truth. Because where truth, where you don't have truth, then lies can live there. So when we don't have truth in an area, then lies are allowed to be there. So what lies have you been believing about your future, about yourself, about your family, about your marriage? Trust that you know the truth and the truth is the word of God and fill those voids with truth. When you hear the lies come in, fill it with truth, fill it with the word of God. The last point that we have today is that the kingdom is represented by ambassadors. The kingdom is represented by by ambassadors. You are an ambassador of Christ. Everyone say, I'm an ambassador. An ambassador is a respected official that acts as a representative of a nation. So they go to another nation, they go to a foreign land, and they represent where they came from. They represent who gave them authority. And we are called to be ambassadors. As we go through this world, we represent another kingdom. We go into the world and we don't adapt what they're doing, how they're living, but we say, I'm from another kingdom and I'm called to come and to tell you and I'm called to preach the word of God. I'm called to stand in truth. We represent another kingdom. There is this story of a missionary who went to Haiti and he was in Haiti and he was telling how that, that nation is so poor and you can, he, you can like smell the urine that goes down the streets. There is trash everywhere. It's actually one of the poorest stations in the Western Hemisphere. And he talked about how it is so poor. And he was driving along and the, he was, had a driver. And he's going through all these neighborhoods, all these houses. And then there's this beautiful house. 
and it has a fence, and it has a lawn, and it's beautiful and wide, and he was like, what is that? Whose house is that? What is that? And he said, that is the U.S. ambassador. That's his house, because he's in Haiti, but he's not of Haiti. He didn't take on their culture, their ways of life. He said, I'm here, but I'm not of Haiti. When he needs a new suit, he picks up the phone and he calls back home. He doesn't get it from Haiti. When he needs new shoes to go with that suit, he picks up the phone and he calls back home. When he needs a new laptop, he picks up the phone and he calls back home. Because Haiti is not his source. When we need peace, we need to pick up the phone and call back home. When we need joy, we need to call back home. This world is not our source, but God is our source. And he is the truth, and he is the way and the life. And we can't come into this world and adapt the culture, but we need to say, I'm from another kingdom, and I have a king, and I want to dwell with him and dwell in his presence. We are ambassadors, and he wants us to do something with that. He wants us to move in that and walk in that. And for us today, it is time to dwell with God. It's time to live under his divine authority, live in his divine presence, and we all want that. We all seek that. So as I close today, I want you to think about where you're dwelling Where are your thoughts dwelling? Where are you physically dwelling? Where is your heart at? Where is your mind at? Are you putting God first? These next 20 days, 21 days are so great and perfect timing for this to take the time and say, I'm going to dwell with the Lord every day at this time. I'm going to remove this and fill it with this. And to dwell with the Lord and spend time with him because he wants that so deeply. We're so glad you joined us today. If you made a spiritual decision, whether that was dedicating your life to Christ or rededicating your life to Christ, send us an email at info at rearbridge.church and let us know you made that spiritual decision. Also, if you're joining our Bridge Church family online for the first time, we have a very special gift for you. Send us an email at info at wearebridge.church to share some information on where we can send you that gift. We're so glad you joined us today, and we can't wait to see you soon. Be sure to stay connected, because we're so much better. Together. Together.